Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Hey kids, today on the podcast, I am talking with Dr. Stuart Brown. Dr. Brown is the founder of the National Institute for Play, and he is the author of the best-selling book, Play. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation about play, what it is, why we're designed to do it, and what it can do for us. I really think you're going to like this podcast. Thanks for listening. So, Dr. Brown, you wrote the national best-selling book, Play, and you founded the National Institute for Play. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever called you this before, but you're pretty much Dr. Play. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> but you have an origin story. Uh, you, you kind of discovered the importance of play through looking at the lives of people who had committed, like, horrific acts. Um, towards other people uh can you can you go in just a little bit about that and how yeah, it's hard it's hard right now while we're doing this podcast we've just had a mass murder in uvalde which is another tragic school shooting but the original school shooting that got me ultimately interested in play itself happened way back in 1966 when a young 25 year old ex eagle scout ex marine ascended the University of Texas Tower with an armory after killing his wife and mother and killed 14 people, wounded 32, which then was the largest mass murder in the history of the US. And I had done some work in my residency training at Baylor College of Medicine on violence. So my boss, who was the head of mental health and mental hygiene for the state of Texas and the governor of Texas, pointed me along with a group of others to try and understand why this young man who was killed in the act of doing all of his tragedy, tragic shooting, why he did it, what he did, because he had no legal uh, background and, and he was married and an architectural engineering student here, you know, what's going on here? So some 19 weeks later, 35,000 brain sections of Charles Whitman uh, a distinguished commission made up of people from all disciplines that we could locate that were expert both in motivation and in aggression uh, met and you, we brought together all of our information, which was prodigious. I had spent uh, two weeks in uh, Charles Whitman's hometown of Hollywood, Florida with his family, with his relatives. We sent a team to even look at his Pre predecessors to see if genetically he was programmed for violence. And without going through the whole uh, uh, investigation, the commission discerned that the major reason he could not handle his violent and aggressive uh, impulses, he had had a very disturbed, aggressive, brutal father, but the fact that he couldn't handle these impulses and had on, this, on the surface a normal appearing psyche was because he didn't play. And that was a big surprise to me. I, was a, I had finished training in both internal medicine and psychiatry, but I had no sense that uh, play itself may have a uh, relationship to subsequent violence. So uh, a year or so after this uh, commission met, I spent a year's research with a team in the Huntsville State Prison in Texas uh, studying homicidal males and, and compared them with a, a large number of matched controls to see uh, if we could profile the uh, predecessors of homicide. And lo and behold, what we found, in addition to a lot of others, other findings, was that uh, the play histories of the murderers were tremendously deficient in normal childhood, rough and tumble, playground, good friends, toys, uh, birthdays, that sort of things. It's very different. So that's what launched me initially to be uh, curious about play itself. And uh, that's many, many years ago. So I've had uh, the opportunity to study play uh, both in human beings in the course of a normal lifetime. And I spent four years with the National Geographic 
Society studying animal play in the wild to try and get some picture of play itself as it is as it exists in highly playful creatures. And uh, as a result of that, when I left clinical medicine, uh, I decided that this was a calling for me and I established the National Institute for Play, which you see a logo behind you. And uh, we have had a, a remarkable trajectory, I think an odyssey of discovery about play itself, which is has occurred uh, scientifically and otherwise in the years since the Texas Tower tragedy. So that's kind of a, a nutshell of how I got interested. And I have uh, interviewed probably some 6,000 people from Nobel laureates to murderers in the course of my long life and have a sense of the place and importance of play itself in the lives of all of us. Wow. Um, before, in, in, in doing your research, especially in the beginning, did that, like, I know that the findings were probably extremely surprising, but did they, did they change you as a person? Like, were you already a playful person or did it, did it make you become a more playful person? That's a good question. I, I was fortunate to have a very playful father and an extended family that was full of games and, and hijinks and jokers and gamesters and so on. So I had a grounding in play. So I was probably one of the least uh, nerdy kinds of medical students, but you get into medical school and then into residency and raising kids. And I kind of had lost my sense of freedom to play. Medicine is a very demanding profession, but although I ran and hiked and biked and did things that I still do back then, uh, probably I had lost a little of play, but the, the homicidal people and, this, and the continued study of play itself has uh, certainly had me prioritize it right up to the present moment. Is there... I have a feeling that one man's play is another man's work. Um, is there a, a way that you describe or define play for yourself? And I know you've done this so many times, but I also know that sometimes in the moment of speaking, you get more clarity, especially the more you try to explain things. Hey, so. it, it, it's always good interpersonally to try and come up with, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of fresh answers about play, but I think if you define play, it's, it's, intrinsically motivated. That is, it's something you do because it engages you. It's voluntary. It's done for, for its own sake. And it's fun. It's, it is engaging. And if you look more deeply at it, it's a very, very uh, hardwired subcortical, meaning below the level of the cerebral cortex in the brain, it's hardwired into us as a part of our nature. And you see this in also highly playful mammals and other uh, complex playful creatures. So that play like sleep and dreams or even uh, the immune system or some of our survival drives, they're housed in, in a very ancient part of the brain. Well, that was a very big finding in the course of my research that I didn't think was, I uh, thought play was entirely learned process and you know you'd learn how to how to play volleyball or bridge or or some other things but that it wasn't necessarily a part of our essence as a instinct as a part of being human and yet it is so you're you're saying that we are definitely designed to play not only are we designed to play when you look at a little kid they are designed by play so that the, the early definitions of who you become are often uh, couched in playful terms. So that play deprivation, as we found in the murderers and in, in Charles Whitman, the Texas Tower, and my suspicion is that the young man who just killed, what, 18 people in Uvalde was probably not a player. If you look at the school shooter profiles, they're, they are not players. And there often is a depressive quality that's almost suicidal that is a part of the 
school shooter profile. So play is, is a preventive of, uh, for most of us of getting all down and, and uh, so depressed that we could be homicidal or suicidal. It's, it's part of the buffer we have as human beings in a tough world to somehow manage ourselves. So in a sense, then play can be essential for our own mental resilience. Absolutely. Competency, resilience, optimism, innovativeness, the ability to handle change. It's really related to very much to those kinds of flexibilities, which are necessary in a demanding world. That makes sense to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If, <laughs> if, if we're, well, here's a question for you. If we are designed to play, um, and that's definite, could you say then that we're also designed for joy? Well, I think very much so. I think that happiness, joy, uh, flow, you know, there are lots of terms. I think that uh, uh, there is a quality that happens when play is deficient over time, particularly if you're a preschool and elementary school age kid and and are trying to figure yourself and the world out, it's very necessary as a, as a part of that developmental trajectory. I think, you know, when, it, when you're an adult and you've got three or four kids and a mortgage and the garbage to get out and the dishes to wash, uh, it's a little more difficult to stay playful. However, the attitude and the ability to, uh, sing while you're doing the dishes is pretty important. So, and I, I kind of know the answer to this, but there, there can be several different types of plays. Is, is that correct? Oh, very much so. Yeah, and, you know, the, uh, the play patterns that you, the preferences for certain types of play, you can spot very early, like six months or even uh, in some instances, newborn nursery nurses think they can tell what whether a kid is going to be a, a dancer or a artist or or an athlete or you know or or a, a social butterfly from some of the inherent uh, natures that are part of their inheritance. So yes, there are, there's body play and object play and social play and imaginative play and narrative play. There are all these patterns that are, are preferential intrinsically, but don't always get acted on. Wow. So you could be a play profiler and discover what someone is going to be good at later in life by how they play. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, if parents recognize that the play pattern preferences of their offspring will really re re reveal the essential talent of their kids. Uh, even if they had a mother that was a doctor and a father that was a lawyer and the kid was gonna be a musician, uh, if the kid responded to music in, and that engaged him or her uh, intensely, nourish the music. Don't force your kid to be a lawyer or a doctor, but that's, you know, that's not easy. It's e easy for me to say, but not easy. You know, you got to make a living and get into good college and all that crap. Yeah. All that crap. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so when I was a kid, um, there were playgrounds. We got to go outside for recess and play on monkey bars and things like that. Uh, dodgeball. Um, it was a lot of rough and tumble play. But now that I have kids and them watching them go through school, a lot of that, like the playgrounds, the monkey bars, everything has changed. Like they've almost disappeared. And if play is so essential for our mental health and our well-being and for the actually for the health of others, <laughs> why, why do you think we're so afraid to let children play nowadays? I don't have a, a single answer to it, but I think a complex answer is, in uh, an industrial society, productivity and outcome uh, have become kind of worshiped, making money or getting good grades or, or finding that there are measurable quantitative elements that make you a good person. And that's become kind of a cultural 
standard. What is sad from my standpoint is that the evidence of recess, for example, <clears throat> like you described, or uh, free time given over to uh, in being engaged in something you love ends up meaning that you're more productive, you get better grades, you have better health <clears throat> and better outcomes. So the uh, attenuation of recess, the limitation of playground play is counterproductive to the very things that one would think uh, the school and, and uh, the scientists would long since have said, hey, you know, more monkey bars, two more slides, a swing, uh, you, you know, at recess, for particularly for elementary school kids, but it's, that's not the case. I will say that your question is uh, fortunately being answered again and again. The American Academy of Pediatrics, for example, in 2018 put out a really good paper on the importance and nature of play, how it develops the brain, how it fosters learning. So that I think as the science has more uh, penetration into policy, we'll see more recess, more free time, more, pl more play and the evidence that attention spans, for example, are increased in kids with longer recess and the finished school studies where in Finland, you don't start to do pre-reading until you're seven. Every class has 15 minutes of free time afterward, even if it's outdoors in the free, freezing Finnish winter, they still get plenty of free time and recess. No, that, that is awesome. In fact, I think it was in 2009, mm -hmm. I read a book called Smart Moves. Um, by Carla Hannaford, and it was about how movement can help facilitate learning in children. And that that book pretty much catapulted or launched my business um, for, for helping you. for helping people learn how to move. Um, so I I agree, play can, and movement can be so powerful. Um, well, there's really good brain science to back that up. Uh, Three dimensional movement, uh, in like in a swing when you're an infant, there. Uh, a friend of mine designed a, what's called the ex expression swing, where an adult and an infant look at each other, which, which bonds them, and then they swing oh, wow. <laughs> together. And the swinging stimulates the cerebellum and parts of the brain, and, it, and that enhances language, enhances learning. So play and movement, and movement itself, tremendously important for full brain development and it has ramifications that go beyond just getting physically fit from the movement. It has a lot to do with thinking in three dimensions and other things that are very complicated, but very important. So you're right on in, uh, in emphasizing movement and a wonderful play uh, researcher by the name of Robert Fagan in Alaska watched uh, bears at play in Admiralty Island for 15 years with his wife and quantified survival and, and other elements related to the amount of play these bear cubs that he watched had. And he was, has put together a, a paper in Science Magazine, which <laughs> shows that survival and, and the amount of play are related. That's a complex question, but he's also had a wonderful statement. He said, movement fills an empty heart. And that's like that. Bob Fagan. So that's you can, awesome. put, you, can, you can put that on your website. <laughs> right on. So that swing you were talking about um, yeah. with the stifling or of you know no longer is it go outside and play but kind of stay inside <laughs> be safe um if people are restricted with play do you do you think that is what contributes to um social awkward like where no one wants to make eye contact anymore and you're just talking about making eye contact connecting people through motion um do you think that that hey that, look don't get me started on eye contact because the grounding base of play itself of investigator by the name of Alan Shore from Los Angeles has demonstrated by wiring up mothers and infants that when the smiling little infant and the mother 
make eye contact when they're, each of them is wired up with an electroencephalogram, their brains are in synchrony and that process establishes a sense of trust, a sense for the part on the part of the infant that it's safe, that relationships are good. And what happens when that eye contact make, is made between the smiling mother and the infant is that there's an eruption of joy on the part of both of them, which is hardwired, which is the founding great base of play. So yeah, you know, you get me going and I'm going on this subject. Yo, uh, <laughs> that's fascinating <laughs> to me. <laughs> so, wow. Um, well, then we're all robbing ourselves of of that joy then by not creating eye, not and so no one trusts anybody because there is no eye contact. No, the eye contact is is uh, you know if, if I <clears throat> sit here in my office and look to the side in the morning, <clears throat> and Cookie, my dog, shows up tail wagging, eyes like this. I let Cookie in the in the office. We make eye contact. <clears throat> I am sure, reasonably sure, that if Cookie had a blood sample of her oxytocin level, and I had a blood sample of my oxytocin level, at the time there is that eye contact, the swelling enjoyment that you get from that eye contact is a bonding process that's hormonally uh, intensified with oxytocin. And that we've gotten evidence, Alan Shore has put in evidence that that process is fundamental. So yeah, you know, I could go on and on about uh, attunement between two people requiring eye contact and it's very, a terribly important component. So play can be physical and play can be mental. Is can play be spiritual? I think it's uh, if you were to read a very thick text by a author who now is deceased, who B E L L A H, he feels that the origins of religion in our evolutionary past required playful rituals and that play and ritual and religion are joined uh, together historically. So he, he's a scholar who was well, well recognized in the area of kind of the origins of, of a variety of religious uh, commitments. So I think there's a spiritual component. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the thing that's most evident to me is when I've taken these many, many play reviews and play histories, when you have a, a kind of a, a play deprived adult who's had 20 years and nose to the grindstone type of uh, life, there is a kind of a spiritual uh, diminishment, a less, less verve for the opportunities of life itself, more of a smoldering depression that is ex an example that we all need play as a public health necessity. Mm. For the play deprived adult, are there ways to get them kick started into play? Oh, sure. Not easily, you know, if you've lost it. <clears throat> but uh, most everybody has a memory, particularly when they were a child, of something that was spontaneously joyful. And it, it could be, a, you know, a favorite toy at Christmas or a vacation, vacation time or a song that uh, triggered some, some kind of pleasure. It, high, highly varied, but almost everyone has some kind of memory of, uh, of a purely play, playful state of being. And I think of play when, it, when, it's, when we're full on into it as a separate state of being that it's, it's uh, you're caught up in it, it's, it's who you are, it's an authentic sense of self. And most everybody, if you probe enough, you can find some elements of that in their past if they've lost it in their present. And then you try and have them hook up uh, more and more of that kind of experience 
in adult form if it was from a childhood than uh, than if if uh, they're without it in their adulthood. Awesome. You've got two quotes on your website I want to ask you about. I was looking around on the National Institute for Play. Uh, one of them is play is the only path to finding lasting satisfaction in our relationships and professional work. That's strong. That's pretty strong. I, you know, I, I may have said that in one of my uh, more enthusiastic moments. I think there are many, many, uh, many meaningful experiences that aren't necessarily playful. So uh, I want to qualify that a little bit. I'll have to go back in the website and maybe revise that thanks to you. But uh, I think the, the, uh, the ability to have some optimism in a very difficult world, and we're in that kind of world right now. You know, you go to Ukraine and, and Uvalde and, and uh, Congress and oh my gosh, and climate change, you know, we've got, and yet uh, the human spirit <clears throat> and life itself is adaptive. And one of the major ways we adapt is by, through our play nature. So why is it there? If it wasn't necessary for our survival, we wouldn't, you know, we would have given it up, you know, a few hundred thousand or a few million years ago. We haven't. So, you know, I think it's a fundamental part of coping with a very difficult world. I don't know that you should change the quote uh, on your website. I really like it. Well, that. I'm not sure. You, 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 <laughs> you kind of caught me up on that. <laughs> so you've got another one. Oh, by the way, I, I'm kind of, I get out there sometimes, but, um, you have another quote, and you've already touched on this, but I'll just bring it up again. We are built to play and built by play. And in my mind, the way I think of is like, oh, well, that sounds a lot like love. Very much. Well, I, th I think uh, play and love are, are uh, joined at the hip. <clears throat> I think they, they are necessary components. Uh, the very element that we talked about earlier, the eye contact, there is love between the mother and infant, but that love is also associated with joyfulness and with a sense of smiling and baby talk and all the stuff that gets uh, initiated by that experience. <clears throat> but it's not just play, there also is trust and, and a sense of safety and things which are a really pretty important part of being uh, a competent human into, into the future. That's awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Dr. Brown, if, is there any wisdom you can impart on the listener for their day-to-day -day life or, or for navigating through this, this tough world? I think uh, all of us need to take a look at our lives and have, have an assessment as to whether we're play deficient. And, you know, you can have a very menial, difficult job and often still find some joyfulness in it. Uh, you know, the, there are some Brazilian garbage men, for example, who between their pickups drum on their garbage cans so that while they're having a very difficult job and <clears throat> not very thankful job, they're having fun. They're playing. So I think understanding that it is a priority and a need emotionally, spiritually, physically, physiologically, <clears throat> I think is really an important uh, consciousness that we don't have in our culture. And I think it's a really important public health consciousness that little kids and people in dementia units need to laugh and sing and have some play. Right on. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for your generosity and your time. This has been this has been fantastic. Well, thank you. It's my favorite <clears throat> favorite subject. Should be yours too. Yes, sir. Best to you. <clears throat> Bye now. That was awesome. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.